move on to our panel discussion hosted by our very own Lukas Oberhofer, and he will be joined by three um, colleagues of his. And now I will hand over the mic to my colleague. Thanks, David, for the introduction. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Perfect. So also a very warm welcome from my side to all of our friends and peers uh, tuning in today. It really is a special honor for me uh, to guide you through our panel discussion, circling around the topic of urban air mobility. So um, as many of you already know, the field of urban air mobility has made some incredible leaps forward in the last few years, um, especially in terms of technology advancements. Today, we want to tweak that view a little bit and focus on the key role of the collaboration in UAM of smaller startups and the more established industry players out there. So joining me today, we have Yanis Töpfer. He is Manager of Vehicle and Subsystem Partnerships at Hyundai Air Mobility. We have Tobias Wilhun. He is Program Manager Aerospace and Defense at Rode and Schwarz. And we also have Corbin Huber, who is CEO and founder of D3 Technologies. Guys, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Lucas. We, do we have Tobias on as well? Unfortunately, Tobias was not able currently to make panelists. We're trying to get him reconnected at the moment. Perfect. Yeah, maybe there's a certain number of maximum panelists, so we may, might have to kick somebody out, but we'll see. In the meantime, let's kick it off um, with uh, introduction first, of course. So um, I'd like to give each and every one of you um, a hot minute to present yourself and uh, the company you're with. So, Yanis, let's kick it off with you first. Perfect. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, quick mic check. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Well, thanks, Lucas, and thanks to the entire Starburst team um, for making this event possible and having me here. Right. I think despite these difficult times, it is really important that we continue to come together and really shape what the future after this pandemic will look like. So as Lucas said, you know, I'm Janis Tofer. I'm the manager of vehicle and subsystems partnerships here at the UAM division of the Hyundai Motor Group. And as such, I have the wonderful task of finding, nourishing, and executing the right partnerships for Hyundai to build an urban air mobility vehicle by 2028. Um, as many of you probably already know, uh, Hyundai as a company has made the strategic decision to take our decades of ground mobility experience into the third dimension, right, and become a major player in the emerging UAM market. But for us, this is actually a move that is more than just creating a flying vehicle, right? It is part of our broader group strategy to enable human-centered cities through innovative mobility solutions. And therefore, as you can see, individualization here and I really try to make an effort to stay away you know from non-picture slides if um, we you know our strategy expands far beyond just man manufacturing world-class vehicles we want to bring together the benefits of ground-based mobility and aerial mobility to allow people to move freely and more efficiently through the cities now that's obviously a, a quite a big task right and we understand that it takes we always have the say within our group, it takes a village to open this competitive market. Um, and even we as Hyundai don't have all the resources to do that. Um, but from our side, we are fully committed to play our part in this journey. And we are very excited to take on this challenge um, that this new market holds. So, you know, if you're also excited or as excited as us about um, adding the th third dimension to the future of mobility and share our vision for faster, more environmentally friendly and safer mobility, we would love to engage um, and see how we can join forces. And that's why I'm thrilled to be here today. And thanks again, Starburst, for putting this together and bringing us all together. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank, thanks so much, Yanis, for the introduction and showing us what Hyundai is all about. Um, Corbin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Um, 
I'm Corbin Huber. I'm the CEO of uh, D3 Technologies AG. Um, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade. I had the good luck to manage a number of aircraft manufacturing companies during the course of my um, uh, career. Um, I founded uh, several uh, tech startups, um, D3 Technologies being the latest of that. Um, Taking uh, the lesson from aircraft manufacturing that we serve a fairly limited demographic, quite frankly, worldwide, um, I made it my mission uh, to serve um, a, a more generally applicable um, service uh, with, with, the, with, with the world at large. Um, and I determined that um, air traffic control was uh, automated air traffic control was a good way to do that. And we'll talk about that for a little bit. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, can you swap slides first? Thank you. Um, our mission is to build an automated navigation platform that enables players uh, to do what they actually want to do. Uh, we want to enable cities to open and control their airspace, safeguard their public benefit. We want the fleet operators to be able to plan and conduct flights in real time and operate their vehicles in an integrated safety system. Last not least, we want the users to maximize their personal autonomy. And we're doing this by an integrated um, communication and navigation platform that may even serve as the general communication platform for the entire ecosystem. Um, if we can move down one slide, please. Um, wh where are we as a small company? We're a startup. We've been around for about a year and a half now. Um, we've completed a seed round funding. Um, we're a team of about 15 individuals at this point in time. And we're looking at flight test of our communication backbone um, starting early in the second quarter of next year. Um, we expect our communication backbone to be operative in more than one flight test area as of the end of next year. And we're looking at uh, first use cases, integrated use cases for early um, air taxi applications before the end of 2023. I think the main issue that we're looking at here is a, is a question that we were that we heard a little earlier during the presentation of um, another startup um, referring to the question of design assurance levels. Um, we are coming from the manned aviation side and want to make sure that the evolution of advanced air mobility, as some people call it today, um, is applicable to human transport. So we're excited uh, to be part of this industry um, and um, I'm looking forward to sharing um, views with Yanis and um, oops, help me please. Um, Tobias. David, to to Tobias, yes. Right. Exactly. Who hopefully is joining us in a second in person as well. But in the meantime, we can continue our discussion or um, I think Tobias has not joined yet. Sorry, I think we can't. Um, he should be here now. But Tobias, are you here? Yes. Um, oh, perfect. Uh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> what a time. Yeah, um, Tobias, so, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Very exciting uh, presentation so far. And um, yeah, I would like to give you a little bit of insight into uh, my company, Roden Schwarz. I'm the program manager for aerospace and defense. have been in the in the market for 80 years now I think there's still this startup uh, idea and the startup uh, um, within the company and you can see this in the in the areas where we are active so basically the company has been founded about the topics of uh, radio frequency and high frequency back by um, 80 years ago by our fa uh, founding fathers and you can still see it in our um, markets that we are working in so it's all about test and measurement we are providing a full range of um, uh, I think very good uh, test and measurement equipment uh, that we are known for in addition to that we have uh, a division that takes care about broadcast and media um, providing amplifiers worldwide um, for um, for networks and for broadcasting uh, solutions and then my domain uh, defense and security um, that is part of um, where we uh, all which we address um, through the test and measurement uh, 
portfolio, but also uh, with our um, software-defined radios for Army, Air Force, and Navy. The latest branch is uh, cyber and network security um, due to the fact that uh, this is a very fast-growing market and uh, obviously the, the threats are everywhere at, this, uh, at these times. Um, this is definitely going to be a focus and probably also very interesting for urban air mobility. So if we move to the next slides, Yeah, so um, when you ask, well, what is it exactly that you do uh, in aerospace and defense, I would point to these topics. Um, these are the fields that we are really active in and where we think we uh, are uh, very well uh, situated with the, uh, within the industry. So everything that is uh, regarding radar and sensors, uh, I think, is one of our topics, both on the generating side, but also on the measurement side. Um, down to uh, the system design and uh, pro uh, understanding how the overall system performance is. On the other hand, satellite testing is uh, another focus for us. This is uh, also very interesting because in the end, this will be helpful for urban air mobility as well. Uh, talking about maybe uh, non-terrestrial networks. And finally, avionics testing. Um, this is definitely uh, pointing towards urban air mobility and all the applications there. Thanks. Thanks, Tobias, as well. So now that we're all up to speed, let's kick it off with our panel discussion. So um, in general, there is rarely any other field in the aviation domain, which has shown such an incredible influx of newly funded player entering the market than urban air mobility. And that's both on the OEM side, but also, and very specifically, on the enabling technology side, including energy storage systems, communication, sensors, we've heard about flight management here today as well. Um, and obviously for these players, um, in order to try to capture some of this future potential market, there will be the need for collaboration, for collaboration between those newcomers and the established players out there. And today we want to like, I'd like to extend a little bit more on that topic. So Yanis. Um, I mean, Hyundai Air Mobility, as we've learned today, is a player which entered the UAM market uh, with impressive power. So from your perspective, what are the chances and challenges um, of such collaborations between the startup, like new and, and so to say the established world? What factors are facilitating such engagements? And what is Hyundai currently doing to pursue this? Yeah, um, very good question, Lucas. And first thing, you know, I think there are almost endless chances here, right? And, and what we have seen uh, specifically through UAM is how this you know, technology or this vision even that people could rally behind has really served as a catalyst for us to re-evaluate uh, processes and ways of how we're doing or how we have traditionally done things in aviation, right? Or in the broader aerospace industry. I think that is a very refreshing thing and is really beneficial to the entire A&D industry. Um, and that, you know, quite honestly, would not have happened without these uh, startups, you know, coming in and stepping up. Now, for us as Hyundai, right, we want to continue to enable this process, right? And there are a couple different levers that we use. Um, we obviously have our own team sort of focused on that uh, through our Cradle folks, uh, right? They're very much focused on this early engagement with the startup scene uh, across the world to allow for collaboration and to help these companies, you know, grow and mature. There are also, you know, various different innovation units um, and even locations that we have started. Um, right, and just to give you an example, just yesterday we announced our new innovation center in Singapore, right, that will serve as a test bed for many of these ideas. And that allows us as a big, big, big company, right, to bring in these smaller companies and really rapidly test and iterate on things. But lastly, you know, also from the specifically the UAM side, I mean, we have a whole partnerships team dedicated to this, right? And that's the team I'm part of, and we're called, you know, partnerships for a reason. Um, so for us, we serve as a single point of contact for startups and big conglomerates, um, and therefore have a, have a really uh, ability, you know, to bring the right people together much quicker than what is usually the case. So, right, in summary, sort of what are we, what are we doing? Um, we're really assembling um, the right partners to enable this competitive market. But for us, this is um, 
really, you know, cooperation is key. And for us, it doesn't matter if the partner is small or large, you know, public or private, Asia, Europe, North America, you name it, we don't really care. But for us, it's about the technology and the innovation that they can bring to the table and how we can be more effective, you know, utilizing that uh, through a creative partnership to really make UAM a reality and, uh, you know, tie all the different things together that are required for this to happen. Great. So from your perspective, Corbin, um, I mean, you obviously uh, bring a little bit of a different food to the table, um, especially kind of in, in form of a serial entrepreneur in the aerospace industry. Um, you have supported, as you've mentioned before, several, let's say, icons even of the aerospace industry with, with Extra and, and other players uh, involved. So from your perspective, having done those you know, initially bloody steps of a startup uh, to, to grow into this market, um, what is the aerospace industry doing, and um, especially with a focus on the UAM field, of course, and um, what do we need to do to facilitate such partnerships even better? And how well prepared is the overall industry for this? Well, um, thank you for that question, Lucas. And I'd, I'd like to um, uh, continue the, the line of argument uh, that Yanis presented just now. I, I, full disclosure, um, our company was discovered by um, Yanis' team in Hyundai and they reached out to us. So we are already a, pos a, a working example of how Hyundai is actually going about um, creating their own ecosystem. Um, I'm, um, I admire the way they are doing it because they have obviously made cooperation a central part of their policy, um, which I think is probably the way that um, this needs to uh, be done. I'm not terribly convinced at this point that this is um, across the bench, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I admire the way Hyundai has gone about this. Now, Let's go back half a step. I, I see two different types of collaboration between industry and startups. Um, the one is where industry has a, a roadmap and sees individual projects or technology sectors that they want to attract companies in in order to solve a problem that has been established on their own roadmap. Um, there is a second type of cooperation that would come from um, industry listening into what is going on in startups and identifying whether one of their solutions could actually benefit their process. Those are two significantly different steps. Um, now, again, what and just using Hyundai as an example here, as a recent and, and, and very um, uh, apropos example, Hyundai is obviously doing both. They are they have initial they have ideas of their own and are looking for suppliers that can fill um, white spots on their own technology map. But they're also listening into tech, into in, into the startup community to see whether there are solutions there that could benefit them. Now, um, to be quite honest, in my own appreciation, I have not seen a lot of that type of activity. So um, I, I see considerable activity out there in in um, founding accelerators, industry accelerators that are geared towards uh, filling white spots on their own <coughs> map. Um, I think that the entire industry could uh, be pushed and promoted if industry would also uh, look into um, alternate solution par paths for their own uh, strategies. Um, I think the type of event that you're holding today may be part of that. Um, I think the ability for startups to showcase their potential for um, non-typical industries or new industries or have the opportunity to show what they could do in an environment that hasn't gone down this path yet is extremely valuable. And I can only rec uh, commend any anyone who kind of spends energy on doing this, because quite frankly, this is not something that the startups can do from a funding point of view. The startups cannot engage in this exercise themselves. So as long we, we, we definitely need this, this platform that allows us um, to create partnerships in two directions. Again, the white spot and the new solution approach. And again, what you are doing is it goes a long way in this direction and we need more of that thanks corin for your insights i mean with this especially the hyundai um 
let's say the three collaboration here or um, the, the, the connection you've, you've made right now, Corbin, is definitely something, a good example of this intertwined collaboration, but maybe bring an even different um, perspective, perspective to the table. Uh, now over to you, Tobias. I mean, um, let's talk about what is doing to facilitate these kind of introductions uh, and collaborations, of course, and um, what collaborations you're currently pursuing. But I'd also like to touch on an interesting point um, what we what we've seen now, which I assume wasn't possible beforehand, where we let's call it turning the tables. We're now um, not startups, not a supplier to those established players, but the other way around. We're now established players need to come up to startups to sell them their products and services. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, what is important to understand first is uh, we are not going to build an EV tool or, or an UAM. That's not actually our business model. Um, so especially when you look into the test and measurement, but I can be pretty sure that um, our instruments will be part of enabling this technology. Um, when you talk about radar, when you talk about GNSS, what we heard uh, before, when you talk about communication, all these uh, technologies are enabled by um, by our instruments. So uh, what we are actually looking for is, or what we found is, um, since we are in all these technologies, we are actually looking for uh, sm startups that are um, that are pursuing these technologies, that are driving these technologies, and we found that um, we want to partner with them in order to make um, other um, players in the market aware of what technology is uh, all about, where the cutting edge is, and also bring a little bit of, of perspective and best practice to um, to, to the market uh, to to show um, how, for example, our instruments can can help to achieve that. So it's really, um, I would say, what we are looking for is a really win-win situation um, where, um, on the one hand side, we have a story uh, and a technology that we can uh, talk about, that we can show how our instruments uh, play a role in that. And on the other hand, I think the startup has the uh, big ben beneficial um, uh, um, opportunity to have access to a uh, really vast uh, network of marketing efforts and networks and uh, being um, um, being seen in the market and being um, uh, made aware to other um, customers in the marketplace. So I think this is um, maybe a different approach, but it seems to be um, a very attractive approach so far. Thanks, Tobias. And I'd like to, to use that, um, that statement from you, Tobias, now as a segue. You touched on a few technologies already, uh, be it communication and, and, and so on, uh, between those vehicles, which will be, uh, of course, a, a very um, which will, of course, play a very important role in the future um, of enabling UAM uh, on a broad scheme. Um, I'd like, and I'd now like to twist it and have a quick look on the development side of things. So many, of course, see um, UAM as a technology enabler within the aerospace domain, pushing the boundaries of state of the art in, of the industry in terms of development cycles, for instance. Now, from your perspective, um, what technologies within UAM will be at the forefront of this? Corbin, if you want to kick it off with you. Um, I, there are number of technologies that are key to making this happen, obviously. Um, I'm not going to mention all of them. Um, if I look at the industry as a total, I think that um, one of the key um, challenges in this industry is noise. Um, quite honestly, um, the cities that need to adopt um, the, a vertical component uh, will have to prove um, social benefit as they go about installing a, a new mode of transportation. Um, social benefit has the factor of actually benefiting a large demographic within their city population, but the, the, um, the pushback against this will be um, largely noise related. I think people have a hard time. They feel that the world is complicated enough the way it is and they don't necessarily want to crowd up their skies. And noise is a, a very, um, how should I say, it, it, is, it is a factor that can be quoted very easily. And um, I don't see enough effort being put into this, uh, into this topic at this point in time. So I, I see that as critical towards the future success. The other, um, the other uh, critical element that I see is if we want this to scale the way we believe it will, um, 
a large number of existing aviation technologies will not work because they're not built to manage air vehicles at uh, the closing speeds and proximity that are being envisioned. And um, the uh, air traffic management is, is definitely something that needs to come. This, is, this happens to be something that we are uh, actually concerned about. Um, the third factor that I would quote obviously is energy storage and uh, so those are the three things that I see and and to your question um, does that are we an enabler in that respect I do actually think in some areas we are um, and another key area is sense and avoid quite obviously um, and I believe that there are application cases that are easier to operationalize in the sky than they are for instance on the road and if I would have to make a bold guess, I would believe that the automotive industry might be able to learn something from aviation about 10 years down the road. Very interesting point, uh, picking up the automotive um, area here. Maybe over to you, Yanis. I mean, Hyundai obviously is a key player in the, in, in the automotive sector as well. Um, with that as a background and the potential massive synergies we could yield uh, with the automotive industry, where do you see your kind of um, three top three technology verticals with the biggest pain points? Um, yes, thanks. So, <laughs> so I would probably expand a little bit from what Corbin said, right? And I think there's noise as an element of it, but I think aviation traditionally has a, uh, a reputation issue also when it comes to environmental impact in general, right? So anything that can make this uh, more environmentally friendly, be that on the emission side, be that on the noise side, even be that on the right materials and recycling side, I think all of that is, is going to be key for uh, this technology to take off. And it's therefore, you know, for me, a, a key technology that is going to drive that. The second piece is um, obviously autonomy. And this is again where, you know, a lot of the technology that Corbin is developing comes in, even some of the technology that, you know, Tobias company is working on to, to verify and test a lot of the solutions. Uh, will be really, you know, key to make sure that at the scales that we're thinking, we can really fly all these vehicles through the air safely. Um, and the last technology, and that is something I personally think is often overlooked, there's also a strong element on the uh, structures and manufacturing side. And that is because we, we all know the inherent weight challenges of uh, battery power or even hydrogen power or whatever it is, um, power source. But if we can save, you know, a couple of percent uh, of overall weight on the structure side, that gives us much more flexibility uh, in either the mission or in the propulsion system that we could put on there uh, to achieve the missions that we want to. So those are the three things I would point out from our side. Thanks, Janis, for your take on this. Um, Tobias, over to you again. Um, I mean, Orange Wilds has been at the forefront of making communication and connectivity across various applications, safe and secure. What role uh, do you think will those factors play in urban air mobility? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, we are finding, we are still finding out, but I think it's going to be uh, quite a paramount uh, um, point of view, especially when you look at not uh, an, um, like at the actual use case. So we are talking about something that flies um, within the city limits, close to cities, that flies maybe autonomous, that flies uh, safe, uh, that flies in uh, a lot of weather conditions. So for that, you need sensors, you need navigation, you need aids, you need uh, communication. And I think uh, if you would ask me what the biggest challenge is, um, obviously, currently, people are looking to batteries and noise and all these topics. I think this is going to be um, obstacles that from my perspective will be overcome. But when we really entering into the market, you need to have a fully designed system. So every everything needs to work together smoothly and reliably. And I think this is still something, for example, that the automotive industry is learning right now. Um, if you, for example, look at the uh, test uh, efforts that they take in order to make um, their latest branch of cars um, a viable product, uh, this is amazing. We have not seen this before. And if you now take this uh, best practice and uh, look into the um, urban air mobility scene, I think this is uh, going to be something that all of these players need to have in their minds in order to address uh, the market with a viable product. Thanks, Tobias, also for, the, for your nuanced um, insights on that one. 
And now finally, before moving on to our next um, startup presentations we have prepared or the startups have prepared today, I'd like to use uh, the panel today to tap your extensive experience within the industry um, to share your lessons learned on all those collaborations between startups and established players out there. So what is your main message, your key lesson to share, if you will, uh, to the startups presenting today, to the startups out there, the aspiring entrepreneurs, um, trying to enter the, uh, the UAM market. Maybe let's kick it off with you, Tobias. Uh, that's a good question. Um, if I will put myself in the shoes of uh, of a startup today, I think um, I, I would really follow uh, the vision. I think it has been become very clear that uh, UAM has been um, has been a vision now for a couple of years, uh, four, four or five years or seven years maybe. But uh, really, you see that um, how we change the market and how we address the market uh, in with technology in a very nice way and in an unprecedented way. I mean, for example, think about Tesla uh, 15 years ago. That was not a company that was nobody would have thought of that. So I think uh, really following your vision uh, and and uh, pushing through with technology, um, I think this is going to be the key. And um, as I said, I think a couple of presenters said it before, I think uh, the opportunities are really bright. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there. That's great to hear. Yanis. Yeah, from my side, I would say, you know, UAM is something really new to the aerospace world. So I always like to compare it almost with a blank piece of paper. So don't be afraid to, you know, question the status quo and, um, you know, just because it has been done for decades, it doesn't mean that it's right. But here's the big but that I want to give everyone, or I want to um, make sure that everyone reminds that, right? Aviation is very safe and has been very safe. And that is a big reason due to the processes that are in place, right? So don't just discard them, don't throw them overboard. Uh, if you can manage to bridge that gap between, you know, bringing in your new ideas, but making it in a safe way that even aligns with further uh, with the past aviation you know, processes and things, um, it's going to be key and that is really going to make you successful. Thanks so much, Yanis. Corbin. Well, let me share with you um, a statement that I find so important that I have it on the wall behind me. Um, you may not be able to read this, but the future is uncertain, but the only way to figure it out is to write it yourself. Um, I think that is what I'd like to kind of leave um, other startups with. Um, we need to shape the future, like Janis said just now, stay focused, um, find scalable business uh, applications, but also find industrial partners and cooperations that allow you to demonstrate your potential. Um, you probably will not be able to do it all on your own. Um, find good friends. That's it from me. Very inspirational. Thanks, Corbin. That's been it from our panel. I'd like to thank all of the panelists today for taking the time and exchange ideas with us. It's really been a pleasure to talk about uh, the it's very exciting domain of urban mobility and I think we can all agree that there's um, heaps of great innovation, heaps of great collaboration between players to come, and there's plenty of room for uh, a lot of players in there. So thanks so much for joining in. It's really been a pleasure. And with that, back to you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thanks to the all four of you. Very interesting discussion you had on the topic of urban air mobility and fostering the collaboration between startups and established players. Thanks so much again. Now we will be moving on with our